Part six, chapter four of the life of Florence Nightingale, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume Two, by Edward Tyus Cook. Part Six, Chapter Four, Advisor General on Hospitals and Nursing, Parts One, Two, and Three, eighteen sixty-eight through eighteen seventy-two we are your soldiers and we look for the approval of our chief miss agnes jones in a letter to miss nightingale from a correspondent in the north of england quote, i have got a colliery proprietor here to cooperate with the workmen to build a hospital for accidents will you kindly give me your opinion on the best kind of building End quote. from a correspondent in london quote, we are proposing to form a British nursing association. May we ask for your advice and suggestions? End quote. These letters are samples of hundreds which Miss Nightingale received, and to all such applications she readily replied. She constituted herself, or rather she was constituted by her fellow countrymen, a central department for matters pertaining to hospitals and nurses. From all parts of the country, from British colonies and from foreign countries, plans of proposed general hospitals, cottage hospitals, convalescent homes, were submitted to her. She criticized them carefully. When she was consulted at an earlier stage, she often submitted plans of her own. In all such cases, there were experts among her large circle of friends, architects, sanitary engineers, military engineers, hospital superintendents and matrons to advise and assist her and here a curiously interesting thing may be noticed miss nightingale had begun her work as a reformer with the military hospitals so high was now their standard that she often went to them for models many plans for ideal hospitals were drawn for her at this time by lieutenant w f amamni r e at the war office the improvement of buildings and of nursing went on concurrently and miss nightingale used her influence in each department to improve the other if she were consulted only about buildings she would answer quote, these plans are all very well as far as they go but your hospital will never be efficient without adequate provision for a supply of properly trained nurses End quote. If she were asked to furnish a supply of nurses, she would say, By all means, but you must satisfy me first that your buildings are sanitary. Thus, when she was asked to send nurses to the Sydney Infirmary, she stipulated that the plans of the building should be submitted, and when the War Office was negotiating for a supply of nurses for Netley, there was a voluminous correspondence about the improvement of the wards and of the nurses' quarters. There was a great extension during these years of societies for the training of nurses and of the introduction of trained nurses into infirmaries and other institutions. All this involved a large addition to Miss Nightingale's correspondence. As the nursing system extended, many questions arose with regard to the relation between the medical and the nursing staffs, and she was constantly referred to for suggestions and advice. She printed a code of suggestions in 1868 dealing with such matters, and three years later she and Dr. Sutherland drew up a code for infirmary nursing, which was approved by Mr. Stansfeld, the president of the newly formed local government board. Her correspondence was as extensive with individuals as with institutions. Hundreds of girls who thought of becoming nurses applied to her, and she generally answered their letters, but the supply of nurses barely kept pace with the demand. Miss Nightingale was impressed in particular by the lack of suitable applicants for the higher posts. There were many women anxious to take up nursing as a profession. There were few who possessed the social standing, the high character, trained intelligence, and personal devotion which were necessary to make them successful lady superintendents, and much of Miss Nightingale's correspondence during these years was to friends in various parts of the country who were begged to enlist promising recruits. 2. 
among the women who sought out miss nightingale for advice were queens and princesses she guarded very jealously however the seclusion which was necessary to enable her to do her chosen work and she did not allow it to be invaded at will even by the most exalted personages her position as a chronic invalid gave her the advantage she could pick and choose by feeling a little stronger or a little weaker she made two rules which she communicated to her influential friends she would not be well enough to see any queen or princess who did not take a personal and practical interest in hospitals or nursing and she would never be well enough to receive any who did not come unattended by ladies or lords-in-waiting any interview must be entirely devoid of ceremonial it must be simply between one woman interested in nursing and another in eighteen sixty seven the queen of prussia was paying a visit to the english court and queen victoria asked miss nightingale through sir james clark to see queen augusta miss nightingale was assured that the queen had given much personal attention to hospitals miss nightingale saw her july sixth and found that the assurances were well founded miss nightingale to julius mall thirty five south street july twenty eighth eighteen sixty seven i am a little unhappy because the queen of prussia's secretary told madame maud that i had seen the queen i liked her i don't think the mixture of pietism and absolutism is much more attractive at the court of prussia than at the court of rome still i am always struck especially with our own royal family how superior they are in earnestness and education to other women i know no two girls of any class of any country who take so much interest in things that are interesting as the crown princess of prussia and princess alice of darmstadt especially in theological matters and administration End quote. the queen of holland it will be remembered had not been received but at a later time miss nightingale saw her in november eighteen sixty eight and again in march eighteen seventy i think of you wrote queen sophia march twenty ninth eighteen seventy as one of the highest and best i have met in this world the princess alice asked for an interview in eighteen sixty seven through lady Abair, who was able to inform miss nightingale that quote, the princess has been to see most of the hospitals in london with a view to learn all about them so as to improve those in darmstadt End quote miss nightingale saw the princess in june and in subsequent years there was much correspondence between them but the royal lady who made the greatest impression on miss nightingale was the crown princess victoria it had been explained to miss nightingale by one of the princess's ladies that her royal highness had always thought a life devoted to the comfort of fellow beings and the alleviation of their sufferings the one most to be envied and that quote, she knows your notes on hospitals and notes on nursing almost by heart end quote. the princess was in england at the end of eighteen sixty eight and was full at the time of schemes for a new hospital at berlin for lying in hospitals for a training school for nurses she showed her practical purpose by sending to miss nightingale in advance her architect's plans they had two long interviews in december and miss nightingale had a very busy fortnight with dr sutherland in collecting statistics about various lying in hospitals and in preparing plans with the assistance of the army medical department and the war office sanitary committee on the best model miss nightingale was delighted with her visitor she took every point she told dr sutherland as quick as lightning i have a fresh neophyte she wrote to sir john mcneill december twenty fifth eighteen sixty eight in the person of the crown princess of prussia she has a quick intelligence and is cultivating herself in knowledge of sanitary and female administration for her future great career she comes alone like a girl pulls off her hat and jacket like a five-year-old drags about a great portfolio of plans and kneels by my bedside correcting them she gives a great deal of trouble but i believe it will bear fruit End quote. that the inquiries of the princess were searching and her commissions exacting appears from the correspondence miss nightingale to the crown princess of prussia thirty five south street december twenty first eighteen sixty eight madam 
in grateful obedience to your royal highness's command directing me to forward to osborne before the twenty fourth the commissions with which you favoured me i send one the portfolio of plans for the hospital near the plots and sea and in this envelope the criticism upon the plans also in another envelope two a sketch of the nursing hierarchy required to nurse this hospital with a training school attached even to ages desirable as desired by your royal highness also three the methods of continuous examination in use with full-sized copies of the forms to test the progress of our probationers probe schwestern also four lists of the clothing and underclothing even to changes of linen we give to and require from our probationers and nurses and of the changes of sheets your royal highness have directed me to send patterns in paper of our probationers dress i have thought it better to have a complete uniform dress such as our probationers wear for indoors and outdoors made for your royal highness's inspection even to bonnet cap and collar which will arrive by this messenger in a small box and parcel i am afraid that the aspect of these papers will be quite alarming from their bulk but i can only testify my gratitude for your royal highness's great kindness by fulfilling as closely as i can the spirit of your gracious will i am sorry to say that i have not yet done encumbering your royal highness the plans for lying in cottages had to be completed at the war office and are not quite ready but they shall be forwarded before the twenty fourth i think we have succeeded in producing a perfectly healthy and successful lying in cottage by means of great subdivision and incessant cleanliness and ventilation which includes the not having any ward constantly occupied in one of these huts we have had six hundred lyings in consecutively without a single death or case of peripheral disease or casualty of any kind this experience is i believe without a fellow but will i trust have many fellows before long believe me your royal highness's inquiry about these things does the greatest good not only with regard to what is proposed in prussia but in stirring up the war office the medical authorities and other officials here to consider these vital trifles more seriously and thus thousands of lives of poor women of poor patients of all kinds will be saved even in england through your royal highness's means hitherto lying in hospitals have been not to cure but to kill as i have again to trouble your royal highness about these subjects i will not now enter into two or three other little things with which i was commissioned may i beg always to be considered madam the most faithful ready and devoted of your royal highness's servants the crown prince of prussia to miss nightingale osborne december twenty fourth eighteen sixty eight i don't wish to lose a minute in thanking you for your great kindness and for all the trouble you have taken for me your letter is so excellent and all the information you give is most valuable and will be of untold use not only to me as a guide in my humble endeavours to promote a serious conscientious and rational spirit in the treatment of sanitary matters but to many others in germany your precious time has not been wasted while you were writing for me i assure you the dress i think very neat and nice and not clerical looking which is in my eyes an advantage i was so vexed that i forgot to tell you the other day how much i admired una and the lion i read it this summer in germany and thought it touching and lovely in the extreme i colported it right and left after i have arrived at berlin and had leisure thoroughly to go into every detail of the materials you have given me i will write to you again these few lines are only to express my earnest thanks the crown prince wishes me to say how sorry he is never to have seen you he shares my feelings when your name is mentioned i trust that the next time i am in this country i shall see you again i remain dear miss nightingale yours gratefully victoria negotiations with the nightingale fund were presently opened and the crown princess sent fraulein Fuhrmann, who afterwards superintended the victoria training school for nurses in berlin to receive her own training as a nightingale nurse at st thomas's three the nightingale training school had for many years been extending the area of its influence and miss nightingale herself in spite of her incessant work in other fields never lost general control and supervision of it 
year after year she kept up correspondence both voluminous and intimate with mrs wardroper the matron her brother-in-law sir harry verney was now chairman of the council of the nightingale fund her cousin mr henry bowman carter had succeeded mr clow as secretary a duty which he continues to discharge to this day sir harry verney saw miss nightingale frequently with regard to the business of the school between mr bonham carter and her there is a great mass of correspondence extending over forty years and more conducted sometimes by an exchange of letters through the post sometimes by notes of question and answer at her house as in the case of dr sutherland mr bonham carter alike as secretary of the fund and as a cousin devoted to miss nightingale personally gave his time and zeal without stint to the work but he had independence of character he was once asked how he contrived to do other things besides serve miss nightingale when it was getting late he explained i used to say now i must go home to dinner his devotion good sense and business-like habits contributed largely to the success of the undertaking and saved miss nightingale much trouble in matters both of detail and of general administrative policy but questions of what may be called the superior direction of the school were always referred to her and there were many occasions on which her personal influence was felt to be indispensable it was especially brought to bear whenever a contingent of nightingale nurses was sent from st thomas to occupy new ground the phrase quoted at the head of this chapter from a letter by miss agnes jones when she was thus sent to pioneer work in the liverpool workhouse exactly expresses one side of the relationship between the nurses and miss nightingale but she was more to them than a chief she was not a distant and almost impersonal abstraction like the widow at windsor the lady in south street was not only the queen of nightingale nurses she was also their mother the principal lieutenants who went out on important service and many members of the rank and file maintained constant correspondence with her sending to her direct reports consulting her in difficulties looking to her and never in vain for counsel and encouragement miss nightingale took especial pains to help and to influence the lady superintendents who went from st thomas's in command of nursing parties among her earlier papers containing thoughts about her future work there is more than one reference to richelieu's self-multiplication she strove to extend her work by creating lieutenants in her own image one of the most important of the missionary voyages of the nightingale nurses during these years was to new south wales miss nightingale had for some time been in correspondence with sir henry parks then colonial secretary in new south wales about the nursing in the sydney infirmary and in december eighteen sixty seven miss osborne sailed with five nurses to take up the position of lady superintendent the nurses arrived in time to nurse prince alfred when he was shot during his visit to the colony there is a letter from sir william jenner to miss nightingale july fourth eighteen sixty eight saying quote, i have received the queen's command to tell you how very useful they were her majesty says she is sure this information will give miss nightingale much pleasure End quote in one respect the nurses were more successful than miss nightingale desired at first all went well there were difficulties with the doctors and others of course but sir henry parks was always helpful there was no flirting miss osborne reported may twentieth and all the nurses cling round me in difficulties like true britons but they did not cling for long their services were too much appreciated in a few years time all the five had either married or received valuable appointments outside the infirmary and miss osborne had to recruit her staff from the colony itself miss nightingale thought that the expedition had thus failed but there was something to be said on the other side and the diffusion of the nightingale band did much to promote the extension of trained nursing in the colony another expedition of great importance was an extension of the liverpool experiment to london in eighteen sixty eight mr afterwards sir william wyatt the leader of a reform party in st pancras had entered into correspondence with miss nightingale with regard to the new infirmary built under the act of eighteen sixty seven at highgate he submitted the plans of the building and suggested the introduction of nightingale nurses 
she approved the plans encouraged him in his good work and in the following year eighteen sixty nine miss elizabeth torrance was appointed matron with nine nurses under her her experiment was presently extended and a training school for nurses was established at the infirmary there are about one hundred letters from miss torrance a year a figure which will give some idea of the close touch which miss nightingale kept with important lieutenants she considered miss torrance the most capable superintendent they had yet trained eighteen seventy and the letters bear out the estimate they are those of a canny capable and devoted woman taking everything quietly as part of a day's work with no fussiness or needless self-importance i have never seen such nurses wrote the medical superintendent when miss torrance and her staff had been at work for some nine months they are so thoroughly conversant with disease that one feels quite on one's mettle in practice what strikes me most is the real interest they take in the work and this is the secret of their success not attainable by the pauper nurses whom they displace inspectors guardians and other officials would have done well to feel quite on their mettle in miss torrance's presence also for her letters show her to have been possessed of a humorous shrewdness which took the measure of men by no means always at their own valuation miss torrance among other reformers introduced useful work into the occupation of the intimates the achievement i am most proud of she wrote eighteen seventy one is getting the men's suits cut out and made i found a tailor in number two ward who cut out some and i sent them into numbers one and four to be made but there was a tailor in number one who made difficulties you see ma'am it's such a very old-fashioned cut once a week at least the matron wrote reporting progress or difficulties to miss nightingale who replied with advice books presents nurses of whom the matron reported well came in batches to see miss nightingale they returned wrote miss torrance of one occasion of the kind beaming with delight but as they all talked about it at once i did not gather very clearly what passed sister a however feared that sister b must have tried miss nightingale sister b it seems had the same fear about sister a nurses and matron alike regarded their reception by miss nightingale as a high privilege i always feel refreshed for months wrote miss wardroper march eighteen seventy one after one of those affectionate receptions you accord me none of miss nightingale's soldiers left her cabinet without feeling a better and a braver woman miss torrance presently fell from grace in miss nightingale's eyes by becoming engaged to be married at a critical period of the engagement she failed to keep some appointments at south street and miss nightingale did not recover equanimity till she recalled to herself a saying of mr clow's persons in that case should be treated as if they had the scarlet fever in november eighteen sixty nine there were receptions in south street such as a sovereign sometimes accords to warriors or statesmen on the eve of a great emprise a superintendent of nurses mrs diebel and a staff of six ward sisters were setting out from st thomas's to take charge of the war office hospital at netley miss nightingale received them all gave them presents and addressed words of encouragement that i have seen miss nightingale wrote one of them will be one of the white milestones on my road to which i shall often look back with feelings of gratitude and pleasure i trust that i shall never forget some of the things you said to me and that looking up i may be enabled to show by my future life that your great kindness has not been thrown away the netley sisters wrote miss wardroper are overflowing with love and gratitude for all the interest and trouble you have so kindly taken for and in them your reception pretty presents and good advice have quite won their hearts to know you and to have heard from your own lips that each one has your best wishes and prayer for success will do much to cheer and help them End quote i have been preaching to them four hours a day wrote miss nightingale to madame mall november twenty first and expounding regulations some of them are very nice women one was out with dr livingston and bishop mackenzie on the zambezi mission one a woman who would be distinguished in any society accidentally read my little article on una and wrote off to us the same night offering to go through our training which she did and join us End quote expounding regulations was always a part of miss nightingale's exhortation on such occasions 
in this particular case she had a hand in making the regulations in other cases she often found them very stupid they were generally made by men who were incapable she thought as we have heard already of devising suitable regulations for women oh how i wish there were no men she wrote on one occasion when trying to compose a hospital choral but even bad regulations must be observed till they can be altered and women did not always understand that some diplomacy was necessary to obtain the alteration women she said are unable to see that it requires wisdom as well as self-denial to establish any new work End quote as the work which the nightingale nurses had at this time to do was all new there were many difficulties and most of them came up to miss nightingale for solution or advice when a very long-winded letter arrived she would often send it on unread to dr sutherland for him to digest and advise upon it was her comfortable persuasion that he had nothing else to do and she scolded him if there was any delay but sooner or later he did the work for her and his advice in such matters never failed in shrewd common sense sometimes he would say this letter shows a fit of temper on the nurse's part and is a case for a little homily from you in such homilies miss nightingale would mingle an appeal to higher motives with a reference to her own example and experience as in the following letter to a discontented nurse april twenty second eighteen sixty nine do you think i should have succeeded in doing anything if i had kicked and resisted and resented is it our master's command is it even common sense i have been shut out of hospitals into which i had been ordered to go by the commander-in-chief obliged to stand outside the door in the snow till night been refused rations for as much as ten days at a time for the nurses i had brought by superior command and i have been as good friends the day after with the officials who did these things have resolutely ignored these things for the sake of the work what was i to my master's work when people offend they offend the master before they do me and who am i that i should not choose to bear what my master chooses to bear you have many high and noble points of character else i should not write to you as i do but the spirit of opposition in which you are working or rather were at the time you wrote for i am satisfied that it was only an ebullition of the moment and yet doing your work well and doing good would if it really were persisted in materially increase the difficulties of that work to which i am sure you are devoted End of Part 6, Chapter 4, Advisor General on Hospitals and Nursing, Parts 1, 2, and 3 of 6. Part 6, Chapter 4 of The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 2, by Edward Tyus Cook. Part 6, Chapter 4, Advisor General on Hospitals and Nursing, Continued. Parts 4, 5, and 6. 4 there was one failure in the work of the nightingale fund which led miss nightingale to write a new book which none ever cost her more labor in eighteen sixty seven the midwifery school established in king's college hospital had to be closed owing to the high rate of mortality in the lying in wards as soon as the figures were brought to miss nightingale's notice she set to work in examining the whole subject of mortality in lying in wards she soon found that no trustworthy statistics of mortality in childbed had yet been collected she searched for them throughout this country and from foreign hospitals and doctors she discovered that in lying in wards everywhere the death rate was many times the amount of that which took place in home deliveries this fact showed that public attention should at once be called to the subject and at the same time it opened up larger questions there was one school of medical opinion which held that the mortality must in the nature of things be large in lying in wards 
there was another which held that the high rate of mortality therein might be prevented the inquiries which miss nightingale had made for the crown princess of prussia inclined her to the latter view and she pursued her researches in all directions collecting an immense mass of information and calling in the assistance of sanitary engineers and other authorities it should be remembered in all this that the introduction of antiseptics has much altered the conditions since the time of miss nightingale's work now under consideration materials for the book accumulated but time to put them into shape was wanting dr sutherland on whose assistance she mainly relied was no more able than she herself to give undivided attention to the subject but at last with his help the book was written it was published in october eighteen seventy one with the title introductory notes on lying in institutions the book did for this special subject something of the same service which notes on hospitals had done in the general sphere miss nightingale showed by statistical evidence that many lying in wards and institutions were pest houses she showed the importance of isolation and extreme cleanliness and furnished model rules plans and specifications for sanitary lying in hospitals in the latter pages the book was an extension of the notes on nursing to this special branch she urged the importance of training schools for midwives described the ideal of an institution of the kind and pleaded for midwifery as a career for educated women there was much agitation at the time for the admission of women to the medical profession miss nightingale in a letter addressed dear sisters suggested that there was a better thing for women to be than medical men and that is to be medical women she was in the country when the book was passing through the press and dr sutherland in sending a last revise with some suggestions of his own said july twenty second Quote, i return the proof corrected don't swear but read the reasons on the accompanying paper it is a good thing you are at lee hurst or your dear sisters would infallibly break your head they will probably break your windows however you are clearly right and let them scream and stamp the book is a very good contribution to the subject and will excite surprise and some opposition but the facts are too strong End quote miss nightingale put out her book tentatively in a questioning spirit as she explained in this characteristic dedication which had received mr jowett's imprimatur but puzzled some of the reviewers Quote, if i may dedicate without permission these small notes to the shade of socrates mother may i likewise without presumption call to my help the questioning shade of her son that i who write may have the spirit of questioning aright and that those who read may learn not of me but of themselves and further has he not said the midwives are respectable women and have a character to lose End quote. five the preparation of this book has been delayed by the franco-german war of eighteen seventy seventy one which brought a great addition to miss nightingale's labors there is a huge pile of documents on the subject amongst her papers a letter to an old friend gives an idea of one branch of the correspondence miss nightingale to harriet martineau thirty five south street february eighteen seventy one oh this year of desolation the one gleam of comfort through it all was the rush of an english-speaking people in all climates and in all longitudes not the rich and comfortable but the whole mass of hard-working honest frugal stupid people who have contributed every penny they could so ill spare women have given the very shoes off their feet the very suppers out of their children's mouths not to those of their own creed not to those of their own way of thinking at all but to those who suffered most in this awful war all all have given every man woman and child above pauperism i have been so touched to receive from places i had never heard of 
but which it would take me a day to enumerate from congregations who had seen my name and a stray london newspaper as helping in the relief of the war sufferers sums collected by halfpence with a long letter to say how they wished the money spent from poor hard-working negro congregations in different islands of the west indies poor congregations of all kinds puritan chapels in my own dear hills national schools factories london descending congregations without a single rich member london ragged schools who have nothing to give gave up their only feast in the year that the money might be sent to the orphans in the war who wanted more than we some of the letters from distant parts of the empire show that florence nightingale had already become somewhat of a legendary figure it was known that scenes of misery and horror were being enacted in europe it was assumed that she was ministering in the midst of them in one of the letters there seems to be a confused idea that she was in two places at once both directing the movement in london and nursing in some red cross hospital in france or germany and there is a sense in which this vague and legendary conception was true miss nightingale played a busy part though entirely behind the scenes in the work of aid at the london headquarters whilst among the devoted women who nursed the wounded or succored other sufferers from the war there were probably few who did not derive inspiration from the example of the crimean heroine the outbreak of the war had found english philanthropy unprepared the british government had been a party to the geneva convention but nothing had been done to organize a society under its rules until the alarm was sounded by colonel lloyd lindsay lord wantage a letter from him in the times of july twenty second eighteen seventy led to the formation of the national society for aid to the sick and wounded which afterwards became the british red cross aid society one of the first acts of the committee of which colonel lloyd lindsay was chairman was to consult miss nightingale and a letter from her was read to the public meeting at which the society was constituted the words of stirring appeal were received with loud cheers if she had not been confined to a sick-bed she would have volunteered to go out as a nurse as it was she must leave the work to others and she gave the volunteers a characteristic note of caution Quote, those who undertake such work must not be sentimental enthusiasts but downright lovers of hard work if there is any work which is simple stern necessity it is that of waiting upon the sick and wounded after a battle serving in war hospitals attending to and managing the thousand and one hard dry practical details which nevertheless mainly determine the question as to whether your sick and wounded shall live or die if there is any nonsense in people's ideas of what hospital nursing is one day of real duty will root it out there are things to be done and seen which at once separate the true metal from the tinkling brass both among men and women End quote. there were those amongst her entourage who wished that she could lay all other work aside and take control of the organization the state of her health made this impossible but she was closely connected with the society's work throughout her brother-in-law sir harry verney and her cousin's husband captain galton were active members of the executive committee sir harry's daughter miss emily verney was an active member of the ladies executive committee captain galton and her cousin mr henry bonham carter were sent early in the war to visit the hospitals of france and germany and when the war was over the task of reporting upon the correspondence of the society's agents and of the english doctors was entrusted to dr sutherland through all these personal connections miss nightingale kept close touch with the society's work she thought that there was a lack of vigor at the start why she wanted to know did not the society advertise itself more if it had been in hiding from its creditors instead of being an aid society it could not have had a more complete success if it had been sick and wounded itself what could it have done less its advertisement ought to appear every day immediately above the theatrical announcements with a list of articles wanted and an acknowledgment of those received Quote, it makes me mad to see advertisements only of the Voicy Defense Fund and the Derby Memorial Fund. What does it matter whether Voicy is defended or not, and whether Lord Derby has a memorial or not? End quote. 
the committee in reply hoped to do more presently as it did it collected nearly three hundred thousand pounds and rendered a great deal of aid both in france and in germany from the moment that the war was seen to be inevitable miss nightingale had been deluged with correspondence the french authorities applied to her for plans of temporary field hospitals the crown princess of prussia applied for assistance and advice in all sorts the dreaded letter has come she wrote to dr sutherland what am i to answer how to express sympathy with prussia without alienating france miss nightingale's personal sympathies were rather on the french side i think she wrote december twentieth that if the conduct of the french for the last three months had been shown by any other nation it would have been called as it is sublime the uncomplaining endurance the sad and severe self-restraint of paris under a siege now of three months would have rendered immortal a city of ancient rome the army of the loire fighting seven days out of nine barefoot cold and frozen yet unsubdued is worthy of henry v and agincourt and all for what to save alsace and lorraine of which paris scarcely knows in writing to the crown princess on hospital matters she put in a plea for clemency in the hour of final victory prussia would remember she was sure the future wars and misery always brought about by trampling too violently on a fallen foe and germany will show to an astonished europe that moderation of which victorious nations have hitherto shown themselves incapable miss nightingale here as in other matters hoped more of human perfectibility than she was to find the immediate future was to belie her picture alike of the severe self-restraint of paris and of the unexampled moderation of prussia in rendering aid to the sick and wounded she was however consistently impartial wherever she heard of good work being done whether in france or in germany she was ready to help and she gave disinterested advice to the nursing services in both armies throughout the war she had a large correspondence both at home and with all sorts and conditions of people in france and germany at home she was diligent in collecting money and gifts in kind for the aid society she wrote constant letters and memoranda to members of the executive society advising on all matters from the general administration of field ambulances to the pattern of hospital suits vetoing when she could impracticable suggestions sending lists of the things most urgently needed she received and answered a constant stream of applications from persons inquiring what to send and from doctors and nurses wanting to volunteer for service abroad her correspondence was on a similar scale distributing agents of the society nurses workers of all kinds wrote consulting her in cases of perplexity or giving information on points that they thought likely to interest her abroad her correspondence was on a similar scale distributing agents of the society nurses workers of all kind wrote consulting her in cases of perplexity or giving information on points that they thought likely to interest her the private reports preserved among miss nightingale's papers contain a mass of information about the treatment of the sick and wounded of which she expressed the opinion that it far surpassed in horror as of course it vastly exceeded in scale anything that she had witnessed in the crimea self-devotion on the part of volunteers though it could not remedy the evils was conspicuous in relieving it and many letters to miss nightingale are eloquent of the inspiration which was derived from her example in the crimea and from the messages of sympathy encouragement and advice which she now sent tell miss nightingale said the warm-hearted grand duchess of baden that i have endeavoured to follow implicitly everything she has recommended and that i love and respect her more than any one in the world there are letters too from english and german nurses and workers in which miss nightingale is addressed as dearest of all friends or beloved mistress and queen her services to both of the belligerents were recognized by decorations the french societe de secours aux blesses conferred its bronze cross upon her july eighteen seventy one and from h m the emperor and king she received the prussian cross of merit september but there was more significance in what she gave than in what she received 
among the english ladies who rendered the most devoted service during the war was the wife of an officer colonel cox who had known miss nightingale in the crimea among the german ladies who had done the like was madame Werkner of breslau when the war was over both ladies asked the favor of an interview with miss nightingale madame Werkner became her personal friend and wrote with enthusiastic gratitude when she was asked to visit embley quote, the home of your childhood End quote. and mrs cox wrote july fifteenth how can i ever thank you for the loving reception you gave me i can only say that never whilst i live can it be forgotten End quote. to mrs cox's work the english committee referred in their report of madame Werkner, miss nightingale told something in an address to the probationers at st thomas's quote, at a large german station which almost all the prisoners trains passed through a lady went every night during all that long long dreadful winter and for the whole night to feed and warm and comfort and often to receive the last dying words of the miserable french prisoners as they arrived in open trucks some frozen some as dead others to die in the station all half clad and starving night after night as these long terrible trains full dragged their slow length into the station she kneeled on its pavement supporting the dying heads receiving their last messages to their mothers pouring wine or hot milk down the throats of the sick dressing the frost-bitten limbs and thank god saving many Many were carried to the prisoners' hospital in the town, of whom about two-thirds recovered. Every bit of linen she had went in this way. She herself contracted incurable ill health during these fearful nights, but thousands were saved by her means. She is my friend. She came and saw me, and it is from her lips I heard the story. End quote. The Crown Princess of Prussia also came to South Street, and she let me tell her, wrote Miss Nightingale, a good deal of behind the scenes of Prussian ambulance work. I do like her so very much, and twice as much now that she is really worn and ripened by genuine hard work and anxiety. End quote this visit was productive of large results the princess and miss nightingale had been in communication throughout the war partly by direct correspondence and partly through an english lady miss florence lees who was serving in german hospitals at the beginning of the war the princess had telegraphed and written to miss nightingale begging her to recommend a thoroughly competent english lady for such duty miss lees mrs dacra craven had been sent she was one of the ablest of the ladies who received training at the nightingale school and was presently to play an important part in the development of training nurses in london miss lees was placed by the crown princess in charge of the nursing at a war hospital which she had arranged at hamburg miss lees was also employed to visit and report upon the war hospitals at metz and other places she was in constant correspondence with miss nightingale who from this and many other sources of information had formed a very poor opinion of the prussian nursing medical and ambulance service after collating various reports with dr sutherland miss nightingale said to him that quote, the abnormally bad among the crimean hospitals were luxurious compared with the normal prussian hospitals the only prussian hospitals up to the present standard of sanitary experience she added are those of the princess herself and in them it was h r h who taught the doctors and not the doctors who taught her End quote i do not know whether she communicated to the princess the further opinion that the root of the evil was the bureaucracy quote, it shows what it means to be without the free play of public opinion through parliament and press which calls every public office and almost every society to account End quote. but upon the facts miss nightingale spoke freely as she was requested to do and the princess asked her to send documents the crown princess of germany to miss nightingale osborne july twenty eighth eighteen seventy one i return the deeply interesting and important papers which the crown prince and myself have read most attentively and word for word the crown prince wishes me to thank you particularly for your having let him see these papers much was not new to him 
you know how much interest he takes in sanitary matters how anxious he is for reforms wherever needed every remark offered is therefore always gratefully received by us let me repeat dear miss nightingale how great a happiness it was to me to see you again ever yours with sincerest admiration and respect victoria crown princess of germany of the great and practical interest which the princess already took in hospitals we have heard above the experiences of the franco-prussian war quickened it yet more and in eighteen seventy two she drafted a report on hospital organization subsequently a home and nursing school named after her was established in berlin and the victoria sisters following the lead of the nightingale nurses undertook the nursing in municipal hospitals the success of the Victoria Training School led in its turn to the establishment of similar institutions throughout Germany, and thus Miss Nightingale's words came true, that the trouble she took to inform and inspire the Crown Prince will bear fruit. The experience of the Franco-German War bore fruit in the better organization of the Red Cross movement, especially in this country, and the inspiration here, too, may be traced back to Miss Nightingale the red cross owes its inception as already stated to a swiss physician dr henri dunant he had witnessed the horrors of war on the bloody fields of solferino and he devoted his life thenceforth to the promotion and then to the extension of the geneva convention in eighteen seventy two monsieur dunant read a paper in london upon the movement his first words were these though i am known as the founder of the red cross and the originator of the convention of geneva it is to an englishwoman that all the honour of that convention is due what inspired me to go to italy during the war of eighteen fifty nine was the work of miss florence nightingale in the crimea End quote. six it will have been seen that during the years treated in the foregoing chapters eighteen sixty seven through eighteen seventy one miss nightingale did an enormous amount of work her health during the same period had been no better country air did not bring any accession of strength there is evidence of sleepless nights in numbers of her letters dated in the small hours of the morning and during eighteen seventy and eighteen seventy one especially her letters and diaries speak of great weakness she was able to do as much as she did only by the devotion of the same friend dr sutherland whose relations with his taskmistress have been described in an earlier chapter more and more indeed she seems to have fallen into the habit which had become almost a necessity of saying nothing doing nothing writing nothing her letters to mr jowett and a few other intimate friends alone excepted without first consulting dr sutherland i have illustrated this point incidentally in previous pages but such occasional references give an inadequate account of the extent to which she relied upon him the only way i can work now she wrote to him in eighteen seventy is by receiving written notes from you and working them up into my own language then printing and showing you the work her papers with hundreds upon hundreds of drafts and memoranda in dr sutherland's hand show that such was in fact the way in which the work was done and the process was applied not only to things ultimately printed but almost to the whole range of her correspondence he was sometimes called upon to draft even the most delicate family letters she was asked to suggest an inscription for the memorial to agnes jones at liverpool dr sutherland had first to try his hand at it she was put out by an unwarranted liberty which a publisher had taken with her name the case was sent to dr sutherland with a pressing appeal quote, what shall i do i have no one to act for me End quote. he acted for her he had artistic tastes and served as eyes for her at the international exhibition of eighteen seventy one when he selected some french bronzes for her to give to mr jowett whenever she was asked to join a society or subscribe to a new institution dr sutherland had first to advise and report sometimes she accompanied her references to him with amusing comments as to uncle sam in earlier days did dr sutherland advise her to join a new central philanthropic agency 
she was inclined against it remembering that when cross invented a new insect my grandmother was hard to exclaim are there not enough insects already sometimes a reference may have been made only or mainly for the fun of the thing as when the census paper was left at south street in eighteen seventy one and she sent it off by a special messenger to dr sutherland at the war office to know how she was to fill it up am i the head of this household dr sutherland forbore to say that no doubt was conceivable about that occupation column she continued as i think that everybody ought to have a defined occupation i should like to put what mine is but i don't know how to define it oh replied dr sutherland say occupation none the last column inquired whether the householder was deaf and dumb blind imbecile or lunatic i shall return said she imbecile and blind and if everybody did the same now it would be true don't replied he you are the exception but for the most part her references to him were on matters which either called for some quick application of worldly wisdom or involved considerable drudgery his shrewd good sense never failed and the drudgery though it may have been delayed was always done in the end she is asked to express an opinion on some indian health reports and is tired off they go to dr sutherland who replies i have been through them all you may safely say that they are very well done or pamphlets memorials prospectuses are sent to her and she is in no mood to master them they are consigned to him and in course of time neat little digests are returned and she is advised what to do or say every important letter is similarly sent to him with a note saying what am i to answer or what does all this come to or please advise you must come to-morrow to see my letter before it goes i want to ask you some questions and you must be good in years when miss nightingale was much in the country as in eighteen seventy and eighteen seventy one dr sutherland's daily work for her was the heavier because all communications were through the post there was fret and jar between them in personal intercourse as we have heard and opportunity for misunderstanding was increased when two busy people were exchanging ideas by letter this was especially the case when any work was on hand of which the scope had not been precisely defined and miss nightingale was often impatient i could do work she wrote on one occasion if it were real work done at the least expenditure to myself but to do a minimum of work at the greatest expenditure to myself by driving pumping etc is now physically impossible to me such complaints and such references to her weakness were frequent to the latter dr sutherland always referred in terms of sympathy i know you are very ill i beg you to let me help as much as i can and so forth with regard to the complaints he sometimes laughed them aside thanks for your parting kick which is always pleasant to receive by them as likes it you are a true patty you like to trail your coat but i won't tread on it sometimes he defended himself if you knew what i have had to do i am quite sure you would not have written about the proof as you have done and sometimes he refrained from defence other than simple denial i scarcely know how otherwise to reply to your attack than simply to state that it is groundless am i such a fool i ask myself as to do what she says i have done but this admirable man never lost his temper and never made her reproaches an occasion for declining to help her any more all i can say is i am ready to help i am at your orders in this as in all things such is the continual note of his messages in private meditations often and in letters occasionally miss nightingale spoke of herself as a vampire when she wrote in some such sense to mr jowett he told her to put such talk aside as idle for that way madness lies yet in a sense there was an element of truth in what she said she was terribly exacting she accepted no excuses made few allowances and sometimes assumed that those who worked with her had nothing else to do dr sutherland was a hard worker but allowed himself diversions at norwood he had a garden and miss nightingale was sarcastic about his fondness for digging ponds 
but he had also besides a strong interest in their common work an abiding admiration for the gifts the character and the self-devotion of his friend in addition to his own bread-winning work he gave an immense amount of time and labor to miss nightingale in any estimate of her services to great public causes and especially in connection with sanitation in india an honorable place is due to the collaborator who helped her through many years with unfailing devotion End of Part 6, Chapter 4, Advisor General on Hospitals and Nursing, Sections 4, 5, and 6. Part 7, Chapter 1 of The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 2, by Edward Tyus Cook. Chapter 1, Out of Office, Literary Work, 1872-1874. to Work of Later Years, 1872-1910. to 1910. I ask no heaven till earth be thine, nor glory crown while work of mine remaineth here. When earth shall shine among the stars, her sins wiped out, her captives free, her voice a music unto thee, for crown, new work give thou to me, Lord, here am I. I found this in an intensely evangelical Baptist American's work, a lecture he had delivered upon me now these lines appear to me exactly true and an extraordinary advance in the way of truth on english evangelicalism which banishes work like sin from heaven and has no idea that heaven is to be made out of earth by us florence nightingale from a letter to her father eighteen sixty nine chapter one i am glad that you have given up drudgery for public offices the position which you held was always a precarious one because dependent on temples of friendship and the good will of the minister i am glad that you have a straightforward work to do now in which you are dependent on yourself i want you to have a new life and interest the way of influencing mankind by ideas is the more excellent way Benjamin Jowett, Letters to Miss Nightingale, 1871-1872 Something which you said to me on Sunday has rather disquieted me, and I hope that you will allow me to remonstrate with you about it. You said that you were going to ask permission as a patient to St. Thomas's Hospital. Do not do this. One, because it is eccentric, and we cannot strengthen our lives by eccentricity— two because you will not be a patient but a kind of directress to the institution viewed with great alarm by the doctors three when a person is engaged in a great work i do not think the expense of living is much to be considered the only thing is that you should live in such a way that you can do your work best for i would not oppose you living at less expense if you wish though i think that a matter of no moment but i would live independently five do you mean really to live as a patient it will kill you i do not add the annoyance to your father of a step which he can never be made to understand i look at the matter solely from the point of view of your own work i have cared about you for many years and though i have little hope of prevailing with you i would ask you not to set aside these reasons without consideration so mr jowett wrote to miss nightingale on june twenty two eighteen seventy two i am flattered to hear he wrote a little later july eleventh that you have disregarded duty and conscience for my sake i hope that you will never in future obey a conscience which tells you to kill yourself will you try to hope and be at peace and just ask of god time to complete your work you who have done so much for others ought sometimes to reflect that you have had a great blessing and happiness the intention which miss nightingale had formed and from which mr jowett dissuaded her was not a passing fancy 
it was in accord with a deep-seated conviction as may be seen from a document already quoted nor though she listened to mr jowett's advice did she entirely abandon her purpose later in the year she still thought of giving up her pleasant house in south street and she set various friends to report upon furnished apartments in the immediate neighbourhood of st thomas's hospital they could not find anything that seemed suitable and she gave up the idea but as she could not go to st thomas's she contrived as we shall hear in a later chapter that st thomas's should come to her she devoted herself from this time more largely than heretofore to the detailed supervision of the nightingale school both in what she did and in what she now left undone the year eighteen seventy two marks a new departure in her life it is explained by a summary entry in her diary this year i go out of office miss nightingale had been in office as she called it continuously since her departure for scutari in october eighteen fifty four she had been closely employed that is to say sometimes officially sometimes unofficially upon the administrative work of various departments in matters pertaining to her special interests with the advent of mr gladstone to power in eighteen sixty eight her work in this sort had much diminished her friend captain galton had gone from the war office she occasionally intervened in minor matters as on one occasion with when her friend mr lowe agreed with mr cardwell to accept her view about a certain pension to the widow of an officer and there were other cases of the kind as when she obtained an attentive hearing from mr bruce home secretary for a memorandum which she submitted on the working of the contagious diseases act but her constant employment in connection with the war office was over she had argued with herself in some meditations during eighteen seventy one whether she ought to make a bid as it were for office again she could still exercise a certain official influence she thought if she chose to seek out ministers and ask them to call upon her but the political times were out of joint she argued on the other side so far as her special aptitudes were concerned the strength of mr gladstone's government was thrown into political reform not into administration the administration of the departments as she was not alone in thinking was defective there are many letters of this period in which she contrasts the days of peel and sidney herbert with those of gladstone or disraeli but i must stop she says in one of them or you will say that i am aping southey who said you know that the last ministry was so bad that nothing could be worse except the present but coleridge differed from him for he thought the present ministry so bad that nothing could be worse except the last at any rate what miss nightingale cared for and was fitted for she said to herself was only administration in the years when she was in office she had not only written reports she had been able to organize the mechanism for carrying them out now that administration was going as she thought to the dogs it was time for her to be out of office that such was the lot appointed to her was borne in by something that happened early in eighteen seventy two in february lord mayo was assassinated a personal grief to miss nightingale and a great blow she said to her cause and lord northbrook was appointed to succeed him as governor-general miss nightingale was personally acquainted with lord northbrook who had been a friend as also for a time a colleague of sidney herbert but he left for india without coming to see her you have worked for eternity wrote mr jowett april three to whom she had reported the new viceroy's neglect why should you be troubled at the governor-general not coming to see you as he most certainly ought to have done put not your trust in princes or in princesses or in the war office or in the india office all that sort of thing necessarily rests on a sandy foundation i wonder that you have been able to carry on so long with them 
lord northbrook was friendly nevertheless as appears from his reply when she wrote and asked him to see mr clark the sanitary and civil engineer lord northbrook to miss nightingale calcutta january three eighteen seventy three i had great pleasure in seeing mr clark for i had seen his works at barrack poor and knew of the great results which so far as the statistics up to the present time can be said to prove them have followed from the supply of pure water to calcutta i hope soon to see his drainage works at the salt lakes and i have got the particulars of his plan for catch-water roofs for military buildings which i will look at carefully as soon as i can at present i am a little overwhelmed with business which has been accumulating during my tour you may be assured of two things that i fully understand the importance of pure water for the soldiers and that i shall always receive with pleasure and consider with attention any suggestions which you may kindly give me both on your own account and because you were so much associated on these matters with my old master lord herbert yours very sincerely northbrook part two the question had become instant thereupon what was she to do next mr jowett's letters to her at this time as also her own private notes show that she was in a mood of great depression due in part to much physical weakness and suffering but in part also to unsettlement in her plan of life she knew not exactly what to be at she saw before her as she wrote no consecutive path growing out of one's own deeds but only a succession of disjointed lives and unconnected events never she wrote again has god let me feel weariness of active life but only anxiety to get on now in old age i never wish to be relieved from new work but only to have it to do with what zeal she threw herself into fuller work for the nightingale school at st thomas's we shall hear but that was not enough she could not see nurses and write to nurses all day long though indeed she devoted to such duties as many hours as some people would consider a sufficient day's work and besides she was now spending a large part of the year with her father or mother in the country she needed some recreation and the only recreation she ever found was in change of work she sought no glory crown over folded hands mr jowett seized the occasion to repeat his advice that she should find recreation in literary work now that she meant to free herself from official drudgery let her gain permanent influence by writing books or essays i think he said that you seem to me to have more ideas than any one whom i know and again december fourteenth eighteen seventy one you have many original thoughts but you either insert them in blue books or cast them before swine that is me and i sometimes insert them in sermons you should have a more consecutive way of going on she recalled two advice and remonstrances which she had received from mr mill in eighteen sixty seven the national society for woman's suffrage was founded mill had asked her to join it and she had at first refused john stuart mill to miss nightingale blackheath park august ninth eighteen sixty seven as i know how fully you appreciate a great many of the evil effects produced upon the character of women and operating to the destruction of their own and others happiness by the existing state of opinion and as you have done me the honour to express some regard for my opinion on these subjects i should not like to abstain from mentioning the formation of a society aimed in my opinion at the very root of all the evils you deplore and have passed your life in combating there are a great number of people particularly women who from want of the habit of reflecting on politics are quite incapable of realizing the enormous power of politics that is to say of legislation to confer happiness and also to influence the opinion and the moral nature of the governed 
as i am convinced that this power is by far the greatest that it is possible to wield for human happiness i can neither approve of women who decline the responsibility of wielding it nor of men who would shut out women from the right to wield it until women do wield it to the best of their ability little or great and that in a direct open manner i am convinced that the evils of which i know you to be peculiarly aware can never be satisfactorily dealt with and this conviction must be my apology for troubling you miss nightingale to john stuart mill thirty five south street august eleventh eighteen sixty seven i can't tell you how much pleased i was nor how grateful i feel that you should take the trouble to write to me and if i ill-naturedly answer your question by asking one it is because i have scarcely any one who can give me as my dear friend mr clough long since dead said a considered opinion that women should have the suffrage i think no one can be more deeply convinced than i it is so important for a woman to be a person as you say and i think i see this most strongly in married life if the woman is not a person it does almost infinite harm even to her husband and the harm is greatest when the man is a very clever man and the woman is a very clever woman but it will be years before you obtain the suffrage for women and in the meantime there are evils which press much more hardly on women than the want of the suffrage and will not this when obtained put women in opposition to those who withhold these rights from them so as to retard still further the legislation which is necessary to put them in possession of their rights i ask humbly and i am afraid you will laugh at me could not the existing disabilities as to property and influence of women be swept away by the legislature as it stands at present and equal responsibilities be given as they ought to be to both men and women i do not like to take up your time with giving instances redressable by legislation in which my experience tells me that women and especially poor and married women are most hardly pressed upon now no matron serving on a large scale as i have done and with the smallest care for her nurses can be unaware of these till a married woman can be in possession of her own property there can be no love or justice but there are many other evils as i need not tell you is it possible that if woman suffrage is agitated as a means of removing these evils the effect may be to prolong their existence is it not the case that at present there is no opposition between the two elements of the nation but that if both had equal political power there is a probability that the social reforms required might become matter of political partisanship and so the weaker go to the wall i can scarcely expect that you will have time to answer my humble questions as to my being on the society you mention you know there is scarcely anything which if you were to tell me that it is right politically i would not do but i have no time it is fourteen years this very day that i entered upon work which has never left me ten minutes leisure not even to be ill and i am obliged never to give my name where i cannot give my work if you will not think me egotistical i will say why i have kept off the stage of these things in the years that i have passed in government offices i have never felt the want of a vote because if i had been a borough returning two members to parliament i should have had less administrative influence and i have thought that i could work better for others off the stage than on it added to which i am an incurable invalid entirely a prisoner to my room but i entirely agree if i may be allowed to agree with so great an authority that women's political power should be direct and open not indirect and i ought to ask your pardon for occupying you for one single moment with my own personal situation as you have had the kindness to let me address you i cannot help putting in one more word on a subject very near my heart the india sanitary service 
i have worked very hard at this for six years and during all those years my great wish has been would it be possible to ask mr mill for his help and influence but you were so busy pray believe me dear sir ever your faithful servant florence nightingale mr mill found time for a considered opinion of great elaboration and weight it has been printed elsewhere with his reply to miss nightingale's humble but argumentative questions we are not here concerned though she never took any prominent part in the movement for female suffrage she joined the society in eighteen sixty eight allowed her name to be placed on the general committee in eighteen seventy one was an annual subscriber to its funds and in eighteen seventy eight sent an expression of her opinion on the subject for publication it was however mr mill's remarks upon her personal situation that now in eighteen seventy two came back to her if he had said you prefer to do your work rather by moving the hidden springs than by allowing yourself to be known to the world as doing what you really do it is not for me to make any observations on this preference inasmuch as i am bound to presume that you have good reasons for it other than to say that i much regret that this preference is so very general among women she ought not he went on to suggest to hide her good deeds and finally i feel he wrote some hesitation in saying to you what i think of the responsibility that lies upon each one of us to stand steadfastly and with all the boldness and all the humility that a deep sense of duty can inspire by what the experience of life and an honest use of our own intelligence has taught us to be the truth to some of this expostulation she had at the time a conclusive rejoinder she could not write to the times and say be it known that i suggested such and such a dispatch to a secretary of state and am corresponding in such and such a sense with the governor-general but if she were out of office the plea for seclusion behind the scenes failed nor was it ever perhaps of much cogency in relation to her views on religious and social matters now that she had gone out of office was it not her duty to come into the open with her pen part three the first literary task which miss nightingale set herself under this impulse took the form of a series of magazine articles in which she hoped to embody the leading ideas contained in the voluminous suggestions for thought already described during the ten years and more that i have known you wrote mr jowett october thirty one eighteen seventy two you have repeated to me the expression character of god about one thousand times but i can't say that i have any clear idea of what you mean why did she not try and explain in an earlier letter february twenty eighth eighteen seventy one mr jowett had suggested the form of short papers or essays she now wrote three of them of which the first two were published entitled respectively a note of interrogation a sub-note of interrogation what will our religion be in nineteen ninety nine and on what government night will mr lowe bring out our new moral budget another sub-note of interrogation in the first paper miss nightingale in a questioning and allusive style defined her conception of god as a god of law whose character may be learnt from social and moral science and defended such a conception against some current ideas of christian churches on the one side and against the too cold and impersonal creed as she thought of positivism on the other the affinity of her doctrine at some points with the creed of positivism is obvious but she held as an axiom that the existence of law implied a lawgiver and it is a very different thing she wrote elsewhere fighting against evil for our own sakes or fighting for the sake of the lawgiver who arms us fighting with or without a commander 
the scope of the second paper is harder to describe for it throws out a large number of criticisms and suggestions on life morals and philosophy in no very closely related order the general idea however is that the purification of religion requires not destructive criticism but reconstruction and a reordering of modern life on the lines of social service in which latter connection miss nightingale paid a glowing tribute to the pioneer of east end settlers these two papers though they attempt to cover too much ground in a small space abound in happy things by the way we are told for instance that matthew arnold's literature and dogma is marred by a tendency not to fight like a man but to scratch like a cat the doctrine of eternal punishment is criticised in the words of the pauper who said to his nurse after seeing the chaplain it does seem hard to have suffered so much here only to go to everlasting torments hereafter the creed of some contented politicians is hit off by saying that they talk of the masses as if they were silurian strata the third of miss nightingale's papers is the hardest to describe because it is the most crowded of the series its practical purpose may be said in the language of later politics to be a plea for social reform there must be a chancellor of the exchequer and a budget for morality and crime as for finance her conception of social and moral science as an almost statistical study is glanced at and the controversy between free will and necessity is disposed of by the way miss nightingale sent her papers successively to mr froude he was delighted with the first and with the second your second note he said is even more pregnant than the first i cannot tell how sanitary with disordered intellects the effects of such papers will be they appeared in fraser's magazine for may and july eighteen seventy three carlyle was not so favourably impressed miss nightingale's second paper he said was like a lost lamb bleeding on the mountain mr froude's criticism on the third was that it lacked focusing the whole art of getting culinary fire out of intellectual sunlight depends on that the third article accordingly was not printed miss nightingale did not relish carlyle's remark and her equanimity was perhaps not restored by the domestic assurance that florence's mistake had been in not submitting the manuscript to her sister's revision one of the best things in the paper which was not published was a postscript the first article had been widely noticed in the pulpit and the press and had brought to the author many letters some sympathetic as from mr edward maitland others sorrowfully critical there were those who promised to pray for her conversion daily and invited her to join them in that exercise they had not read the article it seemed but only a review of it and among the printed critiques was one which began my knowledge of the scope of this paper is derived from the report of a discourse upon it in her proposed postscript miss nightingale took this opportunity of thanking unknown friends for their sympathy and suggestions and still more unknown friend enemies for their criticisms but yet more should i have thanked the latter had their criticisms been on my poor little article in its rough state the original cow and snuffers and not on seeing the extract of a criticism of an extract of my article certainly a new art must have arisen in my elderly age out magazining magazining and i hereby confidentially inform the shade of mr fraser that he may on application to me see columns closely printed columns of small but cruel print upon a paper which the writers state that they have not read what read a paper which we are going to review yes mr fraser this is what magazining has come to articles and not even written on original works even if that work be only an article but on a review of an article and not even upon that but upon a review of a review of an extract of an article or sometimes upon an extract of a sermon upon an extract of a review of an article i ought to feel flattered i tried to feel flattered but mr fraser 
is life long enough for this is this the way to human progress and but as this will not be read by my unknown critics i come to a stop the practice which miss nightingale thus satirized has not become less frequent in later days when the newspapers supplied their readers not with political speeches but with opinions based on summaries of them and when what are called educational handbooks aim at giving the student the power of passing a critical judgment upon authors without the necessity of reading them end of part seven chapter one parts one two and three part seven chapter one of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook out of office literary work continued four and five a few days after the appearance of miss nightingale's first paper in fraser mr mill died of a local endemic disease at his house near avignon she was profoundly moved miss nightingale to julius mole may twenty eighteen seventy three john stuart mill's death was a great shock to me mr grote used to say of him talk of mill's logic why he is thrilling with emotion to the very finger ends that is just what he was now speaker and subject are both gone he said at mr grote's funeral with an agony of tears we might have kept him ten years longer and now we say of himself with tears we might have kept him for ten years longer he was only sixty-seven he was always urging me to publish he used to say with the passion which he put into everything he did say i have no patience with people who will not publish because they think the world is not ripe enough for their ideas that is only conceit or cowardice if anybody has thought out anything which he conceives to be truth in heaven's name let him say it i did not answer that letter i thought that this year i have left much of the india and war office work and much of it has left me i would resume with john stuart mill and do as he told me i put the article in fraser's magazine which i now send you to please him and now he is dead and will never know that i intended to do what he wished he used to say tell the world what you think your experience it will probably strike the world more than anything that could be told it he quoted my stuff in his book which he ought not to have done i published my book on socrates mother partly to please him it was a very odd thing it was a subject he had taken up he was president of a society for that when he was in england till a fortnight before his death i could not find his address i was so overwhelmed with business and illness i did not know he was going away and i did not send him this book and now he is dead and will never know but i scarcely regret his death he was not a happy man he was a man who was so sure to develop very much in a future life he had queer religious notions did not believe in a god or in a future life but believed in a sort of conflict between two powers of good and evil i remember showing you one of his letters and you said it was just like zoroaster but he was the most truly liberal man i ever knew if it were for the cause of truth that he should be defeated he would have liked to have been defeated and now he is dead and we shall never see his like again it was characteristic of miss nightingale that she entered into correspondence with mr chadwick on the sanitary state of mr mill's house and the climatic conditions of provence in may 
mr chadwick had to put himself right in her eyes by explaining that he had not been consulted by their friend on those subjects and had never been invited by him to avignon five other literary work which occupied miss nightingale a good deal at this time was undertaken either to help mr jowett or in accordance with his advice he had urged her to work out her notion of divine perfection and her theory of the family in relation to sisterhoods and other forms of association miss nightingale wrote essays accordingly on what is the evidence that there is a perfect god on what is the character of god and on christian fellowship as a means to progress the gist of the latter essay may be given in a letter of an earlier date miss nightingale to benjamin jowett july eighteen seventy i think that faraday's idea of friendship is very high one who will serve his companion next to his god and when one thinks that most nay almost all people have no idea of friendship at all except pleasant juxtaposition it strikes one with admiration yet is faraday's idea not mine my idea of a friend is one who will and can join you in work the sole purpose of which is to serve god two in one and one in god it almost exactly answers jesus christ's words and so extraordinarily blessed have i been that i have had three such friends i can truly say that during the five years that i worked with sidney herbert every day and nearly all day from the moment he came into the room no other idea came in but that of doing the work with the best of our powers in the service of god and this though he was a man of the most varied and brilliant conversational genius i have ever known far beyond macaulay whom i also knew this is heaven and this is what makes me say i have had my heaven the two other friends with whom in former times she had been a fellow worker were arthur clough and her aunt mrs smith miss nightingale's other essays led to much correspondence with mr jowett but as they failed to come up to his standard they were laid aside many of her letters to him were themselves almost essays extracts from one or two consecutive letters will show the kind of discussions into which miss nightingale loved to involve her oxford friend and upon which he was nothing loath to enter benjamin jowett to miss nightingale torquay september twenty ninth eighteen seventy one i must answer your letter by driblets when you admit that a part of the witness of the character of god is to be sought for in nature how do you distinguish between the true and false witness of nature for we cannot deny that physical good is sometimes at variance with moral for example in marriage the sole or chief principle ought to be health and strength in the parents whether with or without a marriage ceremony in other words plato's republic i mean on physical principles or again the laws of physical improvement would require that we should get rid of sickly and deformed infants and if as huxley would say you reconstruct the world on a physical basis you have to go to war with received principles of morality i suppose that the answer is you must take man as a whole and make morality and the mind the limit of physical improvement but it is not easy to see what this limit is because men's conceptions of morality vary and although we may form ideals we have to descend from them in practice therefore i do not agree with you in thinking that there are no difficulties although the old difficulties about origin of evil etc are generally a hocus of theologians miss nightingale to benjamin jowett lee hurst october three eighteen seventy one i am quite scandalized at your materialism i shall shut up you and plato for a hundred years in punishment in another world till you have both obtained clearer views 
is it for an old maid like me to be preaching to you a master in israel that even on physical principles there are essential points in marriage to turn out the best order of children which being absent the perfection of health and strength in both parents is of no avail even for the physical part of the children and might i just ask one small question whether you consider man has a little soul if he has ever such a little one you can scarcely consider him as a simple body an animal or even as a twin the soul being one twin and the body the other but as all one the soul and the body making one being although only in this sense if you do at all events god does not and consequently he makes a great many more things enter into the physical constitution even of the children than the mere health and strength of the parents my son really plato talked nonsense about this take a much more material thing than the producing of a bad or degenerate family or race take a railway accident what are the laws therein concerned you have by no means only to consider the physical laws the strength of iron the speed of steam the smoothness of rails the friction etc etc but you have to consider the state of mind of directors whether they care only for their dividends so that the railway servants are underpaid or overworked etc etc you quote huxley he is undoubtedly one of the prime educators of the age but he makes a profound mistake when he says to mankind objects of sense are more worthy of your attention than your inferences and imaginations on the contrary the finest powers man is gifted with are those which enable him to infer from what he sees what he can't see they lift him into truth of far higher import than that which he learns from the senses alone i believe that the laws of nature all tend to improve the whole man moral and physical that it is absurd to consider man either as a body to be improved or as a soul to be improved separately as to the laws of physical improvement requiring that we should get rid of sickly and deformed infants they require that we should prevent or improve not that we should kill them that would be to get rid of some of the finest intellectual and moral specimens of our human nature that have ever existed and even were this not the case the heroism the patience the wisdom of our race have been more called forth by dealing with these and the like forms of evil than by almost anything else the good of man in its highest sense cannot be attained by neglecting one set of laws or one aspect of man's nature and cultivating another i entirely therefore agree that you must take man as a whole but this seems at variance with the celebrated author's next sentence and make morality and the mind the limit of physical improvement if i were writing i should use a word signifying the exact reverse not limit but expansion enlargement multiplication master or informing spirit as plato says the mind informs the body owns the body the body is the servant of the mind how can the owner and the master be the limit we must really pray for your conversion benjamin jowett to miss nightingale torquay october four what have i said to deserve such an outburst i have no wish to shake the foundation of society what i think about these matters is feebly expressed in a part of essay at the end of the introduction to the republic but when i come to a second edition i will express it better a comparison of the passage in the first and second editions of mr jowett's introduction respectively shows how largely he profited by the criticisms in the foregoing letter his plato first appeared in eighteen seventy one and at once he began revising it 
in this work miss nightingale gave him great help her greek had now grown a little rusty but her interest in the substance of plato was intense she annotated mr jowett's summaries and introductions very closely and sent him voluminous suggestions for revision you are the best critic he wrote whom i ever had several of miss nightingale's notes are preserved in rough copy amongst her papers and by means of them her hand may be traced in many a page of mr jowett's revised work in the first edition of the introduction to the republic he made some remarks on love as a motive in poetry which excited miss nightingale's strong disapproval she agreed that the illusion of the feelings commonly called love was a motive of which too much had been made but the poets she thought had as yet hardly touched the theme of true love two in one and one in god as an incentive to heroic action the philosopher may be excused mr jowett had written if he imagines an age when poetry and sentiment have disappeared and truth has taken the place of imagination and the feelings of love are understood and estimated at their proper value take out that mean calumny my son wrote miss nightingale take it out this minute blaspheme not against love the offending sentence was expunged in the second edition mr jowett had gone on to blaspheme a little against art citing the mohammedans as a case of the state of the human mind in which all artistic representations are regarded as a false and imperfect expression either of the religious or of the philosophical ideal miss nightingale objected that the mohammedans had renounced the use of pictures and images but not of architecture mosques are the highest kind of art the one true representation of the one god the glory of god in the highest the most high of the most high higher than any christian art or architecture as you would say if you had seen the mosques of cairo mr jowett recast his passage and used miss nightingale's illustration almost in her words i am always stealing from you he said on his introduction to the gorgias she made an interesting criticism is not socrates more ineffably tiresome and at the same time does he not speak higher truth in the gorgias than anywhere else why call these higher truths paradoxes are not your sermons always a sort of apology for talking to them of god and why should your introductions be a sort of apology for recognizing that socrates speaks the highest truth and no paradox have guarded statements whether about god or any particular moral or truth ever produced enthusiasm of religion or in morality is there any dialogue not even excepting the phaedo and crito where he is so much in earnest he is so terribly in earnest that towards the end he even throws all his dialectic aside and makes even polis in earnest to me speaking as one of the stupid and ignorant it seems that your introduction dwells too much on the form of the gorgias and does not bring out in sufficiently striking relief the great truths which socrates labours so strenuously to enforce that he almost seems to lose himself in them these great moral truths are are they not one it is a greater evil to do than to suffer injustice if you call this a paradox why do you not call the fifty-third chapter of isaiah a paradox is it not the highest of truths two it is a greater evil not to be punished than to be punished for wrong i have no idea why you call this a paradox it follows from all the higher experience of the life of every one of us 
in family life i see it every day i see the spoilt child making himself and oftener herself and every one else miserable down to mature life or extreme old age though the punishments of my life have been somewhat severe yet i can bless god even in this world that never in all my life have i been allowed to do as i like if the reader cares to take this passage to a comparison of the second with the first edition of mr jowett's introduction he will discover again how largely and closely miss nightingale's criticisms were accepted she dealt similarly giving precise references for every statement with the greater part of the dialogues in the phaedrus said mr jowett july twenty two eighteen seventy three i have put in most of what you suggested and made some additions you are quite right in thinking that i should get as much modern truth into the introductions as possible it is a great opportunity which i have had in view but not so clearly as since you wrote to me miss nightingale continued as in former years to send mr jowett suggestions for sermons i have written part of your sermon he wrote when she had sent him an outline of what she would like him to preach from the university pulpit when he became master balliol he projected a special form for daily service in the college chapel and miss nightingale suggested a selection of passages from the psalms under the heads of god the lord god the judge god the father god the friend the way of the cross and so forth mr jowett had however to abandon the project in deference to superior authority another scheme was carried out in eighteen seventy three an edition of the bible appeared which has a history of some interest the school and children's bible it was called the name of the rev william rogers of bishop's gate appears on the title page but the selection was in fact made for the most part by mr jowett with the help of some of his friends that mr swinburne was one of these friends we know from the poet's own recollections it is not generally known that the other principal collaborator with mr jowett was miss nightingale mr swinburne's help was in one respect disappointing i wanted you said mr jowett to him with a smile to help me to make this book smaller and you have persuaded me to make it much larger the poet who was complimented on his thorough familiarity with sundry parts of the sacred text thought that mr jowett had excluded too much of the prophetic and poetic elements not taking into account the delight that a child may take in things beyond the grasp of his perfect comprehension though not beyond the touch of his apprehensive or prehensile faculty miss nightingale whose familiarity with the bible was probably even closer and more extensive than mr swinburne's and with whom biblical criticism was a favourite study also wanted a great deal put in which mr jowett had left out but her instinct for edification led her to suggest equivalent omissions she took great pains with her suggestions illustrating them in letters to mr jowett with many characteristic remarks by the way it is impossible to keep up acquaintance with a man however otherwise estimable who separates the twenty-six last chapters of isaiah from isaiah merely by a shabby little note and asterisk surely those chapters belong to the end of the babylonish captivity and should be separated by a distinct division while the shabby little note and asterisk might go to some isolated chapters for example thirteen fourteen among the first thirty-nine which belong to the same time the end of the captivity whereas the first thirty-nine chapters generally appear to belong to the middle ages of prophecy but as it may be judged inconvenient to put chapters forty to forty six of isaiah in a different part of the bible i will concede that point and simply classify them i follow ewald's order 
but they must be under a separate heading with end of babylonian captivity or words to that effect printed distinctly under the heading not in a note more generally she criticised the first selection sent to her as showing some want of proportion there was no clear plan she thought as to the space to be given respectively to a matters of universal importance moral and spiritual for example the finest parts of isaiah jeremiah ezekiel and the new testament b matters of historical importance for example which embrace the history of great nations egypt assyria babylon the petty wars of the petty tribes seem to take up a quite disproportionate space c matters of local importance which have acquired a universal moral significance for example jonah is entirely left out yet jonah has a moral and spiritual meaning while samson balaam and bathsheba have none d matters of merely local importance with no significance but an immoral one for example the stories about abraham isaac and jacob almost all joshua and judges and very much of samuel and kings the story of achilles and his horses is far more fit for children than that of balaam and his ass which is only fit to be told to asses the stories of samson and of jephthah are only fit to be told to bulldogs and the story of bathsheba to be told to bathsheba's yet we give all these stories to children as holy writ there are some things in homer we, we might better call holy writ many many in sophocles and aeschylus the stories about andromache and antigone are worth all the women in the old testament put together nay almost all the women in the bible i have just finished the children's bible wrote mr jowett february tenth eighteen seventy two i blessed you every time i took the papers up especially in the prophets i have adopted your selection almost entirely with a slight abridgment and it is further approved by mr cheney's authority these various literary enterprises undertaken at mr jowett's instance occupied a great deal of miss nightingale's time more time as she sometimes said to herself than could rightly be spared from primary duties and the time was spent she added in her self-reproaches to little purpose in some respects mr jowett's suggestions to her were not very happy one cannot elaborate in a consecutive form a scheme of theology or a social philosophy even through the medium of essays in odd hours as a bywork so miss nightingale soon found and the failure weighed heavily on her spirits but mr jowett did not realize how great was the strain upon his friend's faculties involved in her nursing work nor how much time effort and emotion she was devoting though out of office to the complicated problems of indian administration we who have access to her papers shall learn the full extent of these preoccupations in later chapters three and four but something must first be said of another literary enterprise to it miss nightingale's close study of the bible and of plato was entirely relevant such studies were as we shall find in the next chapter part of the food which sustained her inner life End of Out of Office Literary Work Continued 4 and 5